What is happening y'all? Cowboy here and in this video we're going to be talking about how to make the ultimate mage pawn. Now when it comes to the various vocations pawns have available, mage is a fantastic choice because it is the de facto support vocation. It means you're going to always have somebody to top off your health, you're going to have buffs, and to be honest you just can't go wrong with having a mage as your pawn. So before we jump into the specific choices I have made, the first thing I want to do is a full breakdown of mage and what you can expect from their skill set. Business with the guild, sir. I should be glad to assist you. So taking a look at our weapon skills, first up, high flagration. Now this is essentially a flamethrower. Uh, I think this is a very good ability to use if you're playing as mage yourself. I think it loses out on its value a little bit if it is being used as a pawn ability. And the main reason for that is this is, you know, it's it's a cast that is held. And so if my mage is busy holding this flamethrower and focusing out damage, that's time they're not spending buffing or keeping the party up. Uh, but it is still worth calling out. It's, it's a very quick cast compared to a lot of the other spells. Uh, moving on from there, we have High Leaven. Now, High Leaven is also a rather quick cast. In terms of the various DPS options available to mages, this is probably my go-to choice. Uh, it has very good tracking. It can knock harpies out of the air. It can snipe weak points on larger monsters. Can't go wrong with High Leaven. Moving on from there, we have High Frigor. Now, this is actually my favorite of the mage DPS abilities. It's just very showy. I like the big explosion of ice. It leaves a little platform that you can do plunge attacks off of, but this does have a positional requirement to get the most out of it. So this is one that I'm a big fan of, but ultimately I think it gets overshadowed by Levin. Moving on from there, we have Spell Hold. Now, Spell Hold is something that is fantastic if you're playing Mage yourself, but it's a little too situational to be used with a pawn. The idea here is you precast a spell and store it on up. Obviously, this has a lot of uses in combat, but because your pawn doesn't really know what the best thing to store between fights is going to be, I think this loses out when it is an AI controlled character, such as a pawn, versus you as the player. High Empyrean is a large-scale AoE holy damage ability. This is also giving you some great visibility at night, uh, but the damage on this is actually kind of lackluster. It does decent against undead like skeletons, but ultimately I do feel this gets outclassed by a lot of the other abilities, but if you're doing a lot of night playing, it can be just a nice beacon of light in the sky to help you see. High Solemnity is a silence. This is very useful against a variety of enemies, drakes, chimeras, uh, mages, skeletal mages. You can't really go wrong with a silence because you're just going to lock down those pesky casters and make sure they are not hurting your party. High Palladium is probably my favorite uh, support buff in the game. This puts three instances of damage prevention on the characters in your party. And when I say damage prevention, it's kind of similar to that, that uh, Cracked Tear Stone in Elden Ring. The idea is while this is up, you have basically a little bubble. And if you're in the middle of doing a cast or a big ability and a goblin jumps on you, you don't care. You just shrug it off. Uh, if you get hit by a you know giant hammer from a Cyclops, it's still going to splat your character, but you take no damage. So... This is incredibly useful. Cannot be uh, overstated how good that one is. Moving on from there, we have Fire, Ice, and Lightning Affinity. We no longer have access to Dark or Holy Affinity how we did in Dragon's Dogma Dark Arisen. It is now broken down to just the three elements, and I'll be talking about the advantages of these elements after we get through the weapon skills. Moving on from there, we have High Halidom. This is essentially a large-scale AoE cleanse. It can remove... All the debilitations, Frostbite, Unconscious, Sleep, Silence, Drenched, Tarred, Torched, Icebound, Blighted. Uh, very good, especially early on. I do think this falls off a little bit as you move towards more the mid-game because by that point you typically have consumables to get rid of these statuses, making the, uh, the weapon skill slot more valuable for other things. High Celerity is a spell that unfortunately I didn't really feel is all that useful. This creates a haste effect which will greatly speed up how fast your character moves. I think it also speeds up your base attack speed, uh, but generally the classes I was playing were more about the unique attacks they had or their special skills, so I didn't see nearly as much value from this. I do think this may have more value if you were playing as a thief or ranger and you're really focusing on getting those basic attacks out, but you know, as a warrior, you're typically going to be charging your attacks, and as a mystic spear hand, you're going to go into your spin to win, and unfortunately, it's not going to benefit instances like that as much. 
Argent Sucker is a more targeted heal. Uh, the idea of this is you're going to hit somebody with this and it's just going to continually keep their health topped off while that buff is active on them. At the same time, however, we have Anodyne as part of our base kit, which we'll look at in just a second. And Anodyne is also a very effective heal. So unfortunately, I feel like this is kind of just overkill. I don't think we need two heals. And last but certainly not least, we have Celestial Pain. This is a massive AoE that creates near limitless stamina as well as a defensive buff at the downside of your mage falling on their ass after the cast duration ends up finishing. Uh, regardless, still incredibly strong, probably one of the strongest, if not the strongest ability in the game because of how much it enables your pawn. So with that being said, let's take a look at the various elements here. I also want to take a look uh, over here at some other stuff with, with Mage. Uh, as I mentioned, the base kit in Mage now has Anodyne. This is the heal that Mages have access to. And the thing I want to point out is the bubble that's created by this, it's like a waterfall. You don't need to stand in that bubble to get your heal, which is something I did myself for a long time when I first started playing the game. As soon as that bubble is up, you just gotta sprint right through it. That's it. After you sprint through it, you're, you're already enveloped in the healing aura, and at that point, it will continue to heal up any gray health you have. Uh, this is incredibly early, or, or early on, this is incredibly useful, especially because as you continue to adventure, you either have a ton of consumables to keep your gray health topped off, or you have a mage in your party to keep your health topped off. And that's just going to mean farther you can go before having to worry about finding a campsite and resting. And so because of that, I think a mage is just an incredibly useful vocation to have in your party, even moving into the end game, because keeping your party alive, you know, you don't do any DPS if you're dead. Uh, also over here, let's talk about the elements. Now, fire is very straightforward. It's just going to be damage over time and steady intervals. If the target has been inflicted with tar, it causes torched, which is much more significant. At the same time, though, this is more something that's ranger specific because you're not typically just carrying around tar with you. Uh, we have frostbite, which will slow enemies down gradually. If they have been inflicted with drenched, they get icebound, which just freezes them solid. Incredibly useful. And then lastly, we have lightning attacks which uh, lightning can actually cause stun on the target if uh, you get enough of it built up on them. But the big advantage of lightning is that it causes attacks to branch between enemies. And this is important because this is gonna help us choose which affinity we want on our character. So going on over and taking a look at the specific suggestions here. To start, we have high palladium. Now, in general, as to the various support buffs that you could have for your character, I think that early on High Halidom is super useful, and there are a couple of fights where Solemnity is also going to be very useful. But High Palladium is just, it's too good. I mean, you could have this up and you're fighting a Drake, and all of a sudden meteors start coming down from the sky. It doesn't matter. The fact that you can shrug off a direct hit from a meteor, which would typically chunk you for about half your health, if you have a little tick from high palladium on that's top tier you really can't you just can't overstate how good that is uh, moving on from there i think it's very good to always have a affinity unless you're playing as a party that's primarily casters or you're playing as a magic archer yourself this is always going to be useful and to that extent i think ice affinity is the clear winner now drenched is actually pretty common in the game if it is raining in the game, everything will be drenched. If you're fighting near uh, a small body of water, stuff will get drenched. And obviously we can't go into water, but there are little streams you can cross past and you'll get drenched just running through those. So ramping up from uh, just ice affinity up to the, the ice bound status, that's actually fairly frequent. And when you're fighting a chimera and all of a sudden it gets frozen into an ice sculpture and you can just wail on its weak points, that feels really, really good. So while I do like the ability to spread a little bit of damage with lightning affinity and fire is very consistent, ultimately I think ice affinity is the best go-to choice in this game just because of how potent the freeze effect is. In terms of our damage options, I kind of mentioned this already, but high leaven, this is just too damn useful to not use. Uh, I think the big reason being one of the most annoying enemies in this game, to be honest, are harpies. Even towards the end game, I cannot overstate how obnoxious harpies can be with trying to pick you up throw you off cliffs they're they're a very deceptive enemy and how deadly they can be if you don't take care of them uh, and levin will snipe them right out of the sky 
if you're fighting something bigger like a cyclops this will focus fire and hit the eye of the cyclops it is it's also nice that this isn't a positional requirement spell you're going to cast this and it's going to hit the target and while i really do love Fragor and it's a lot of fun to see this come on out and just talk boom 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 and it's a great sound effect levin is just more consistent and since we're talking about what will be the best for your ai controlled pawn levin is the go-to choice and then last but definitely not least celestial pain i can't overstate how good this thing is just to demonstrate how good this is uh, so i'm going to use a rather late game ability on on my character here this is called wild fury and watch my stamina bar i dumped my entire stamina bar there in only a couple seconds if celestial pain was up my stamina bar wouldn't have moved. It would have stayed full. And that's what makes it such an insanely strong ability because there are a lot of classes that have stamina oriented abilities that will completely blow through your stamina. And having infinite stamina so you can use those abilities more frequently, even for like the 10 second duration that that uh, Celestial Pain is up, that's, that's busted. That is super good. So absolutely Celestial Pain. We'll talk about where to get that in just a second. Uh, as for our augments, we're going to take Beatitude from the Mage Tree. This is going to increase the potency of our Anodyne. We take Sagacity from the Sorcerer Tree. This augments our magic. We take Perpetuation from the Mage Tree. This is going to extend the duration of enchantments, so all those buffs that we have. Exaltation from the Mage Tree augments our Stamina Recovery. We're going to be using Stamina to cast these spells. That also works for Pawns as well, so fantastic pickup here. Constancy from the Sorcery Tree. Knockdown is a very, very hard CC to deal with. The idea when you get knocked down, a wolf could grab you by the neck and run off with you. A goblin could pin you. Uh, larger enemies could just grab you and beat on you. So this is going to help prevent all those instances, which is very important for what's supposed to be the support of our party. And then on the note of being a support, we have Subtlety from the Thief Tree. Now, you only got to get up to about Thief 2 to have this, but this is incredibly useful. Uh, even in the fights I've been in where everything kind of goes to crap, my mage is usually the last of the pawns to go down because with this, the, the aggro prevention on this is very real. Enemies are going to target your mage last in the majority of situations, and obviously for the healer that's in the back line to be targeted last, that's fantastic. That is what I want all the time. I should be glad to always a pleasure. Now, briefly to talk about Celestial Pain. I actually have a separate guide that goes in depth into that on the channel. Uh, but to get Celestial Pain, you'll need to finish a quest that is, where did she go? Right over here at Eni's home. Now, this involves meeting a little girl who wants to learn magic, and you have to bring her five separate books. Uh, I do a full breakdown of that on the vocations guide. But if you just want an idea and try to figure out where to go to get that skill, head on up to Eni's home. That is where it is at on the map very early in the game and then hunt down all those books. Moving on from there, the next thing I want to talk about is going to be our armor choices. Now, taking a look at the armors and the weapons we have available, to be honest, most of the time you're always just going to be using whatever the best that you have available for your pawn is. Uh, if we take a look at what Liliana is working with right now, I already have basically the top tier one. The two comparable ones would be Necrotic Shriek and Volant White. These are slightly lower tier. Keep in mind, this one does have a 100% holy on it, which can be quite nice. While this one has a little bit of silence, but that's not going to really come into effect all that much. Uh, but honestly, once you get towards the late game, probably the more important thing is going to be the fashion of your pawns because people like good looking pawns. And I think Liliana looks quite good i went for like a goth elf type vibe and i think she does that pretty well but taking a look at gear in particular that's not actually the best set available if i was to put on the zodiac charm and put on the edified vestment her stats are actually a little bit better here the the debilitations as well as the defenses keep in mind those pieces aren't fully leveled and they do end up being a little bit higher but to be honest this look on liliana does not look nearly as good as this look this gives the the gothic elven princess vibe which is what we want uh, but in terms of best in slot weapon dragon's nous no brainer uh, besides that cloak is largely going to be aesthetic but i do like how the unitor's mantle meshes with the Ares morpho robe 
and then as for rings rings of percipients as well as a ring of recitation this will take our health down lower but keep in mind we are low on the aggro priority list and being able to get off our buffs even faster is obviously a huge boon last but not least going on over into our status make sure that if you are running with a mage you have the kind-hearted inclination this makes sure that your mage is going to prioritize using those heals and those buffs before it is going to throw out Levin. And we do want Levin on there because if everyone is healthy and all the buffs are out, I of course want my mage to contribute and do damage. So it is worth having one damage ability. But in general, Kindhearted is going to make sure that the mage focuses on support first and foremost, which is what I want out of a mage. And with all that being said, that will wrap up everything you need to know to have the ultimate mage pawn. So thanks for coming on by and checking things out. I don't plan on doing this for every vocation. I'm going to do it on the ones that I primarily am focusing on because, you know, I have 80 hours playing with a mage pawn. I do not have 80 hours playing with a thief pawn, uh, but I will probably do some more of these as time goes on. Either way, thanks for coming on by and checking it out, and I will catch you all next time.